Buckeyes have it with 11 seconds. It's just a formality. They preach to be the best. Today, finally, Maryland is the best. Well, Dave, a big weekend for you on a big big variety of fronts when you think about obviously University of Maryland capturing that championship a school that you're obviously attached to and, and, and very fond of and but for the MLL in the draft on Sunday morning a chance to get some of the high-end talent from the collegiate ranks and once again you were busy and, and you made some moves in the first round and that's why I want to start with the option at five what was available but your decision to move back to seven making that trade with the Ohio machine. Well, we thought that if Zach Courier was around, Denver would be a team that wanted to trade for him. We knew John Grant, who's their assistant coach, was coaching Zach Courier up at the Peterborough Lakers. So we thought we'd have an opportunity to move back. Uh, the offers there weren't quite as good, and when Connor Cannonzero was available, the Ohio machine called, and, uh, and uh, we told him what we wanted, and we wanted 7 and 12 for 5, and uh, gave him one minute to make a decision, and he did. And uh, I think it worked well for us, because we were actually going to draft. Uh, Jake Fakaro at, at five. And by moving back to seven, we wound up getting the same player and, and picked up a pick in the second round. Before we dive into Jake, do you go into these drafts with the, the scenarios sort of on paper and then you move as those first four picks are being made? We, we do. We had four different plans uh, in case of Courier being available. One was we were going to not move back if Matt Rambo was available. We were going to wind up taking him. And so we had plans to move back, and then we had plans to stay, and then who we would take if we stayed. And uh, uh, so uh, Brian and I and Mark, we sat down and went over those to what made the most sense, and uh, uh, we felt very comfortable with our plan. Jake, an electrifying score. You talked about how he started at Princeton and then continued that production at Villanova. But why was his value so high on your board? Well, we had heard that he was going two to Boston, and then Boston at the last moment took Sergio Perkovic. Uh, he was, when talking to Jimmy Bernhardt of the Houston Texans, one of the things they look for is versatility in a player. He played attack in midfield at Princeton, attack in midfield at Villanova, and he faced off 152 times. He has two point range, and as what I told a little bit earlier, is that he's probably the only player in the history in the NCAA to own the single goal record for two institutions. He had 10 in a game against Yale when he was at Princeton, and eight in a game against Georgetown, which are school records. And in terms of his game, what would you like to see from him when he does sort of enter this roster? Because playing in the MLL, especially the midfield position, takes a transition, and he was a high-volume shooter. The offense ran through him at Villanova. I have to imagine he's going to have to be a complimentary piece at least to start. Yeah, we'd have to turn the volume down a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, you'd rather turn down the volume than try to speed it up. And so we just can't take bad shots, and I don't think he will. You know, he's coming in with a group of talented players. Uh, he played with Miles Jones on the Empire team, and that was something I went back and talked to Miles about. And he, Miles had nothing but glowing things to say about him as a player, too. So I think he's going to fit into what we're trying to do. And uh, I, I think we could use another offensive midi, one that could score. And I think Jake may be the one. Big body, too. Well, let's move into the second round where you picked up the, the extra picks from the trade with Ohio. And you go with Con Heacock at 11. At times, he seemed to be slated higher. So once again, you almost get more value from a player who is – extremely accomplished, just won a national championship. What was it about Colin that made him right for 11? Well, his size, his athleticism, uh, his ability to play multiple positions. Again, we, we think he, we look at him more as a midi than an attackman right now. And just being a local guy who can come to practice and, you know, talked about how important it was to play for a state team in college and win a national championship there. And then hopefully to play for his local pro team, he'll have that same, uh, uh, ambition to be successful but we just think his size and athleticism was what stood out I mean, versatile as, as you mentioned and then at 12 right next to a, to 11 obviously and it's Matt Reese a guy who <laughs> made a lot of plays in this stadium um, service Academy always interesting you have Garrett Thule on the roster so uh, we know what comes with that but Matt Reese's game seems to be tailor-made for the MLL well, we we're fortunate that I got to see him play a couple times uh, he had four goals in a game as a long pole against Holy Cross. And watching that film, 
all four of those goals would have been two-point goals. And so we think he's tremendous on the ground. He gets a stick and pass the lane. He causes turnovers. But we think he can add something to us offensively. And so he's a I, – I like to – Brian Farrell is one of my favorite players at the University of Maryland. I think he's a, a bigger, stronger, faster Brian Farrell. Reese knocks it away and scoops it up. He is just a vacuum. One. So after Matt, we have two picks, 16 and 19, and, and you describe this draft as deep, one through 15, one through 20. So this is the area where, again, you felt like you needed to grab some value, and, and you stay with the local ties at 16 with Isaiah Davis Allen. What is it comparable? I like the Brian Farrell to Matt Reese. What do you see in Isaiah that you think translates well to the professional league? Well, when we looked at this year's short stick D midi class, the two top to short stick D middies were Jack Adams from Towson and Isaiah. Uh, when Charlotte took Jack Adams, that had forced us because one of our positions of need was short stick D midi, and we only had those two ranked as MLL starters, guys that could contribute right away. So we took Isaiah. I think Isaiah is great between the lines, great off the ground. He can play, stick around and play some offense. He's kind of uh, a transition guy who's uh, maybe a poor man's Matt Abbott a little bit. And uh, But he runs, he clears the ball, he's a one-man clear, and we just think he's very athletic. And he, again, he's a Northern Virginia guy. Have him in practice right away, and, and it should be interesting to see how he transitions with the physicality of this league. And, and maybe the last pick I really want to get your perspective on in terms of what they bring to this team is Josh Byrne. And for the casual fan, if you don't know, he is an unbelievably productive player out of Hofstra. Uh, some general managers and coaches had mentioned he would be a top five pick if he didn't have maybe some commitments down the road to the indoor league, but that doesn't concern you. Why? Well, he plays at Burnaby, and to play uh, summer box, you only have to play in four games. And so a lot of these guys, Sean Evans is at Peterborough, and, and uh, he'll be at Burnaby. So if they just play in their four games that usually are Wednesday or Thursday nights, then it really doesn't conflict with us a whole lot. But I thought Josh Byrne, if he had a Hopkins uniform on or had a Maryland uniform on, would have been in the top two, maybe the number one pick in the draft. I thought he was the most talented offensive player attackman I saw all year. And I really think that he has a chance to be something special. And that's unbelievable because, again, you get him at 19. So 1 through 19 and, and 1 through 20, if we look at this draft, uh, you've done this for a number of years. When you walked away from Toby Keese, where we, we held this thing on Sunday morning, how did you feel about those first uh, five picks that will probably, at least to start, be the ones you're looking for the most impact from? I felt like we got bigger, stronger, and faster guys. Uh, it's our job in the personnel department is to give Coach Reese the most options that he can have. And I think we gave him a lot of options to fill some of the areas that, you know, Garrett Thal, you're just not sure with his military mm -hmm. commitment how long he's going to be there. Josh Byrd can replace him. You know, if we have a problem or injury with a shorty, we, you know, Isaiah Davis Allen can replace him. You add a midfielder in as Jake for Carroll. I thought we, we've given him a lot of options and then he just has to decide which options fit what he's trying to do. And in your experience, what's fair to expect from these guys that are making uh, a, a transition, all accomplished college players, but it's a different beast out in the MLL? Well, I would think that, you know, in within three weeks, you'll start to see uh, several of them start to get game time. You know, I think the first week's difficult, especially for the guys from Maryland who just played yeah. a championship game on Monday. You know, that probably puts them out. You know, uh, uh, burn and and... You know, burn and uh, for, I think for Kara, you'll, you, you know, if he comes down and has an outstanding practice, I think he's, he's an option to play right away. And I think Reese may be an option to play right away, depending on how they practice and if, the, if they're MLL quality. Now, the, the draft expanded to 10 rounds, so there were some more picks. And I wouldn't ask for your favorite necessarily or, or somebody that you, you really are counting on. But of your, your next number of picks here as we trickled into the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th round, um, what were some of the priorities and what do you feel like you did? Well, one of the priorities was face-off. You know, Ben Williams from Syracuse was going into the season as the number two face-off guy. He had a shoulder injury. You know, we took him knowing that he was a little nicked up, that maybe it won't be this year that he plays, but it'll be next year. And Stephen Kelly, you know, mm -hmm. he, you know, national champion. He's won a championship at every level he's ever played at. Uh, we think he's a highly competitive guy. I think he can play shorty. He might even be able to play a little offense if he doesn't face off. So we wanted to solidify the face-off position a little bit, and uh, we think we did. When it comes to a guy like Chris Finnell, 
uh, a defenseman, again, another Navy guy. Um, were you surprised he, he fell as far as he did? I know, again, the, the commitments that these guys will have um, could affect their availability down the road, but he was an All-American, and you got him at 46. But not only that, he was the three-time Patriot League defenseman of the year. And so when we saw him available, we knew he was being stationed out in California, but he's here all summer and all season. So that was, you know, let's take a gamble with it and see what happens. And at that, there's really very little to lose if he comes in and plays for us right away. And uh, he's a local guy in our relationship with Navy. And I think we got two of their best players. And I think it'd be kind of cool to have a Navy guy out on the field playing professionally. I think so. And, and now the next intriguing storyline is really um, in Matt Danowski's part of this, Lyle Thompson's part of this. You have a bunch of really good players and talented players, but that game day roster doesn't change. It's still 19 man active. How will you and your staff go about figuring out who's best starting Friday against the Ohio Machine? Well, that, that's the problem with you activating some of these college guys. You've got to move some of the guys that are on your active off. And you're uh, three and one, too. And that we're three and one. And it's hard really to make well. changes when you win. Exactly. You know, but, you know, we, we do realize Matt Donowski, we've kind of band-aided that right-handed attack spot. We've asked Jay Carlson, who's an inside guy, to be an outside guy. It's not really fair to Jay. So Matt Donowski will probably come down and start on attack right away this week. We, we don't have Lyle Thompson. We don't have Jason Noble. So that won't cause any real change. So the questions for us this week will be the face-off X. Eric O'Brien got nicked up a little bit trying to figure out what to do there, whether we face off with a pole or we face off with one or two of these college guys. So uh, we have some questions at the face-off position that we got to answer. And uh, But I don't think you're going to see uh, wholesale changes to the to the roster just quite yet. And, and we mentioned the lack of practice time, which is a reality, but you do believe that the more players you have on a Friday practice or if you hold a Wednesday practice for a Thursday or Friday game, that the more competitive, the better, correct? Well, I do. But the other thing that you don't, we're not able with the 19 guys you take on the road, if you take 20 or 21, we're not able to go full field. Sure. So at home this weekend, we get all these college players in. We're able on Thursday night to do a 20 or 25 minute scrimmage full field. And a lot of the mistakes we've been making through the game are our inability to correct them in full field. And so this gives us an opportunity right now to start correcting them in full field. Well, it should be an exciting time to see how this roster develops. Again, at three and one, a good place to answer some of these questions against Ohio. Coach, thanks for the time as always. My pleasure.